this is our fourth uh, lecture. It's primarily on organizational purposes and goals. And um, this is uh, like the other lecture. Some of the slides that I'm using have been prepared by a few colleagues from the university. Unfortunately, they have not recorded their names and therefore I'm very obliged to gratefully acknowledge their work while certainly the interpretation is uh, entirely my own. And uh, we will proceed with just that uh, initial introduction. And uh, I wanted to explore how you see the organizational purposes and goals yourself in different organizations. And it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter at this point of time, whether you're working in, in a human service organization or elsewhere, everywhere you will find uh, an organizational goal, a purpose, and they also talk about missions, and they've got mission statements, and they also talk about strategic visions, and the whole gamut of things we'll be looking at, you know, at least a part of it we'll be looking at in this uh, particular lecture. Um, often social workers, uh, often social workers wonder as they speak about their agencies and uh, organizations in human services, they are asked uh, whether, they ask themselves the question, are our organizations really meeting the needs? For instance, uh, let's say child safety. There is a there's a there's a vast difference between how child safety is perceived by different individuals because it connotes it connotes different meanings to different people. From the departmental perspective, uh, a, chi a child has to be safe, and uh, there are some you know there are uh, factors that we look at it from the from the perspective of yeah they must have pay, you know be ideally uh, both parents. Otherwise, even one parent, single parent, never mind what it, the situation is, but some care, some nurturing, and uh, no abuse, no neglect. A few of those attributes are just there. Then we move on with those attributes. Then when we start looking at when a child comes into care and uh, Obviously, you know, we have moved from a system where some inadequacies were there and we are trying to now provide and ensure adequate care. Now, does our adequate care take the whole full meaning of nurture, of care, of meeting the needs, of minimizing neglect, of reducing abuse? In fact, removing abuse totally. These are some of the considerations that come up. When a child is moved from one place to the other, and when a child has to move, let's say, for whatever, you know, could be for challenging behaviors, for his own behaviors, for not able to adjust, is a child. Where do we see? How do we see holistic definitions? How do we understand the imperatives of family in child care? All these things set up anxiousness, set up confusion, and set us into thinking, are we doing the right thing? Think about rural development. Think about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander care. Think about care in remote rural areas. From one perspective, when we talk about remote rural care, it should be holistic. Are departments able to do that? Are we having some piecemeal efforts here? So the mission goals, when they come down drastically to the grassroots, what transformation takes place? How do the social workers look at them? These are some of the things that make social workers feel sometimes a level of uncomfortableness in the, in the realm of their, uh, I'm just going to put off this uh, mobile phone for a while. And uh, yes, so they think in terms of what could possibly be uh, an area in which 
they need to concentrate and work with. And how is that not really aligning uh, or not aligning? The overarching goal might be too lofty, but where they are only working on a very, very small imperative. So how should the goals be? Goals probably will be understood in a very broad sense, like an aim. And what does that signify? An underlying complexity of objectives, some requirements, what we do, the kind of planning and the kind of management that we do. I personally feel that goals ought not to be static because we're dealing with human services. We can have a goal, an overarching goal, but if it is a flexible goal, if you can tailor make the goal, if you can move, adjust the goal, I think you will achieve a lot. So the staticity of the goal is okay when goods and services have to be planned. Trains going in time is important. Milk powder manufacturing from a factory needs to come with you know, whatever quantities and whatever quality and dimensions that you would want. But when it comes down to human services, I think you probably might have to adjust it from time to time on the basis of the needs and also on the basis of the individual requirements. So you remember that in the last lecture of mine, I addressed the necessity of an environmental scan and relevance of environment beyond the agency's four walls. And why did we do that? Because there is a relationship between the environment at outside the agency and us within the agency and the clients who come into the agency or we go to the clients from the agency. So there are those linkages that we keep scanning. So therefore, the goals of the organization are also influenced by the external issues. The mission statements get influenced by the external issues. The purposes of the organization get tailored by the external issues. So when we look at it from that perspective, Now goals certainly are subjected to ongoing resource funding. That's where the external resources, external environment comes to us. This crunching of funding. Not everybody is prepared to constantly increase the budget for welfare. And they depend on political will, wills, not just one. Change of government, party politics, who has an ax to grind, and how is it grinded? Myriad effects, plenty of stakeholders. There was never, you know, when welfare was conceived, human services were conceived, somehow there was this feeling that the government would take care of it, social apparatus will take care of it, but we didn't expect commercial organizations would also come in to the picture. Private organizations would come in. Not-to-profit organizations came in, that was, that was okay. But otherwise, profit-making organizations start coming in and saying, we can run this on a not-to-profit basis, but as a fee-for-service perspective. And the government starts thinking, why not? What were we, what were we doing? We were employing a gamut of services. We were employing a whole huge personnel to look after. We can cut them down. We don't have to pay too many people. We don't have to look after welfare as at the same time welfare workers for a long time. Probably we could 
do it in a, in a way that it's needs based, privatized, various kinds of concepts started emerging. And that's how myriad stakeholders came up. A goal requires a clear analysis regarding the crucial role in determining how we work in an organization. What's going to, what, what is crucial for us? Social workers obviously ought to see clearly a need to participate either at grassroots, at the mid-level, at the higher level. And as far as possible, they also need to ensure that goals are planned and put into operation. Now, social workers who work at the coal face generally don't get that opportunity. I used to work in coal face many, many years ago. No one asked me, is it working for you there? Maybe they did, you know, some service, some people might have been asked, but I felt I wasn't asked. And as a result, what happens is we then may not really give an input into the planning processes or they'll miss out on the way we look at the processes. So HSOs, human service organizations, when we're still looking at purposes and goals, a couple of authors suggested human service organizations exist for a purpose. And this purpose can be identified as its overall goal or mission. I think the book that I've recommended, sorry, it's not a textbook, it's not available or it's available for some people and not available to some. The whole mess about those textbooks there. May and Jones distinguish between mission, goals, and objectives. Mission for them, they refer to it as purpose. It's a broadest or overarching aim of the organization. It communicates what the organization stands for and provides a level of legitimacy in aligning with the larger social purposes of the organization. Rio Tinto is a mining company, but somewhere they're supposed to look after the, the interests of the community. I know social workers would be critical about mining, Environmentalists are critical about mining. Environmental activists would be critical about mining. And what is that critical, critical review about? It comes from the perspective that look, you make a gay, big hole in Mother Earth, gaping hole. I don't know what you do. Those holes remain like that. The underground gets mined up. And certainly we are doing that in traditional lands. And we have a huge legal issues around the traditional land ownership issues, legitimacy, their rights, their compensations, what we do with them, how do we communicate with them, whole heap of things come into the picture. So would Rio Tinto talk in its, in its mission statement about mining or would it talk about, hey, we're going to take care of Aboriginal interests? The commercial organization wouldn't talk about human interests. They talk about larger societal interests. Mining is you know, empowering for the country. Mining is important for us. Uranium mining is very important for us because we can sell it to other countries. So that's how we tend to talk about things and we talk about we talk less and less about the community aspects which result, which become antecedents and possibly resultant of the other work that we do. So when you start looking at the greater good, the smaller good, and what happens 
there seems to be some tensions that come up. We'll look at them, some of them. In the next few slides, I do give some examples of mission statements. Some examples of vision statements are, they look at the bracket, number of words that have been used, human rights campaign, an organization in the United States, equality for everyone, three words. Feeding America, a hungry free America vision statement, Alzheimer's Association, a world without Alzheimer's, Oxfam, a just world without poverty, beautifully said, and that organization, you know, struggles to get that. Has a very good reputation. Most of the volunteers are very, very genuine across the world. A National Multiple Sclerosis Society. Again, of course, the word national comes from. In a United States example, but a world free of MS. The Nature Conservancy Society. Look at that to leave a sustainable world for future generations. Lovely, lofty, adorable, admirable, achievable in the long term. But depends on what? Depends on the work that you can undertake. You can't be doing probably too much of mining, too much of water taken away and then start saying we're planting trees and plant about eucalyptus trees around the world possibly, which probably drain more water. You know, controversies around that. Make a wish foundation that people everywhere will share the power of a wish. Beautiful. I remember having worked on one of my disability, a family with disability, which had a few wishes and we attempted to fulfill those wishes through a proper foundation and through proper work. So the next one is the Three Habitat for Humanity Foundation. A world where everyone has a decent place to live. San Diego Zoo to become a world leader at connecting people to wildlife and conservation. It has an educational purpose. And of course, there are people who are critics of zoo. Because they say, hey, you're holding them in captivity. You're teaching us that there's a wild animal, there's a wild beast. It's as good as what we used to see in the circuses. A wild beast, an untamed beast is brought in and then you have a whip with which you make a lion sit on a stool. I think over a period of time in the last 10, but not, not 10 years or 15 years, we stopped those animal circuses. Instead, we still have trippies, artists, we've got clowns, and we might have a few animals here and there, which anyway do a little bit of tricks, but uh, we don't really start talking about bringing in a wild beast from the, you know, and then we tame it out. So there are no more ringmasters. The trade probably is going down. So there are critics of the zoo. They say, whatever it is, you are holding it in a, in a kind of an environment which is closed, caged. And there are views about it. And people say, then how will we teach them? I can't take all kids to a farm and say, this is how cow is. And this is how milk comes. Otherwise, the kids start saying milk comes from sachets, milk comes from a bottle. Our milk comes from a packet. True. We don't associate the products with anything in nature. So therefore, there is a need for an intermediary or agencies which have a purpose. And then making sure that some of those mission statements talk about what they are trying to do. 
So very carefully in those 12 words, you see that to be a world leader, connecting people to wildlife and conservation. It eliminates or doesn't talk about the, the caging issue. It probably talks about, the, it doesn't talk about the imprisonment issue or anything or the other. So those are some of those dilemmas even in mission statements. It's sim similar to KJX versus barn, barn eggs or eggs laid in, you know, in nature, grass fed cows. We survey something else. So the usual issues come up with all these mission statements. And that's one reason why ecologists, vegans, vegan societies, and a whole heap of people, the new people, the new um, people who think about human rights also think about animal rights. People who think about animal rights also think about why should human being have more rights than that of the animals? So people come up with those kind of mission statements. NPR, it's about radio stations with its network of independent member stations in America, preeminent news institution. And news broadcasting corporation, which is independent. Probably I could imagine more recently, they must have been talking whatever they wanted about uh, Trump or uh, Biden. And of course, America has that kind of freedom for people to talk, talk, talk. And sometimes even talk with, with responsibility and maybe without responsibility. Ducks Limited, Ducks Unlimited, sorry, is a wetland sufficient to fill the skies with waterfowl today, tomorrow and forever. Wow, a very, very lofty ideal. Rabbits in some country are food. So they look for flourish. In some countries, it's a pest. Kangaroos in some states could be exotic meat. In many other places, it's an exotic animal to be protected. I remember one of those universities outside my class within in Australia, they used to come and sit down despite so many university students and everybody around. Fascinating. Uh, there was no feed there, but somehow they had no fear. And that was lovely to see them every now and then. When there's a boring class or a boring statement, students can look out and look at the kangaroos. Oceana seeks to make our oceans rich, healthy, and, abund and abundant as they once were. And there's a statement there. There's a measurement there. There's a history there. Somebody did. Hey, I want to replenish this. I want the junk out of this. In the last one year, one and a half years, COVID has come, COVID-19. So naturally we have not been, many Australians haven't been going to Bali. I know as a result of that, Bali's economy has also gone down because we seem to be one of those visitors who often use Bali. It's a great friendly place, beautiful place. But I have seen it many times. In our environment within Australia, we are a little more careful about cleanliness. And when we go there, we just dump, 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 dump. And the callousness and the carelessness with the environmental health in some of the areas of Bali has been damaged by our own tourism does put some of our some of our tourist industry 
and our folks to shame. Nonetheless, there are wonderful initiatives back again from us, which do talk about, hey, we need to educate our own Australian colleagues when they go to Bali, how to behave. And there are non-governmental agencies set up by our own people to manage sanitation, to manage beach cleaning. You know, like Clean Up Australia, some of us have gone there and have started that kind of a missionary orientation. Now, going back to that little story, it's unfortunate we're not going there. So their economy is down. But on hindsight, it's got cleaned up. A lot, much more cleaner. There are much more healthier breathe, you know, you can breathe better. So the irony of converse, conservation agencies with mission statements is, if you leave nature to nature as it is, it'll come up, it'll grow up, it'll blossom. First, it will survive, thrive and flourish. But what we generally tend to do is do a little bit of that, take a little bit out. And sometimes it just is the damage equals the input to reselect. So that's the way one has to think about. And I think uh, that is an important example that we should be looking at and understanding when we look at goals. Now, there's something else to make oceans as rich, healthy and abundant as they were once. In touch ministries, more of a religious gospel preaching, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to people in every country of the world. That's 14 words. So it's an evangelical thing. Then there are no two words about, no, they're not uh, worried about what they are doing. They go around, they find people who possibly are in various countries. And certainly the evangelists uh, convert individuals from different faiths, if they have faith at all. And, uh, and people, if they see the gospel of Jesus to be meaningful, automatically come into the fold. So in touch ministries. The word in touch is in touch. Touch with oneself. Beautifully said. Cleveland Clinic. Striving to be world's leader in patient experience. It's like a hospital. It's a hospital. Clinical outcomes, research and education. Lovely. Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. I'm not too sure in COVID-19 uh, how much of specialization and how much of social work uh, they could actually hold, but uh, Australian social workers, many of them do go there and pick up some experience and come back and they say it's the largest uh, employing social workers hospital and perhaps it employs every other professional so on. Uh, a larger number. We gain some experience and come back. Come back. Many, many Australian social workers in medical and psychiatric fields have gone there and picked up hospital administration. They've gone there and picked up their experiences. Save the child, save the children fund. A world in which every child attains the right to survive, survival, protection, development and participation. And again, in almost all the country. So that's the importance of a mission statement. Crispy, articulate, modeled in very few words, becomes easier for people to think about. It does convey something. And out of that, the program philosophies then will emerge. So 
then we are talking about HSOs exist for a purpose, yes. And the broad statement of intent provides us the guidelines for an organizational activity. And we do see an overlap between mission, goals. Sometimes they are very specific than mission and often refer to the organizational activity. Mission statements then are brought down into, okay, how do I bifurcate this? How do I trifurcate this? And how do I set it up in an organization? Then comes the objectives. Is there anything big difference? Some authors differentiate and others think goals, objectives. It's the specificity of the statement. The statement of intent becomes a little more specified. Some standards come up to it. Some standards are attached. So I'm going to protect the child. Okay, how? Alternate care. Will alternate care be as good as, you know, mom's care? Yeah, there are quality standards that we put up. Will there still be some deficits? Certainly that may not have the same motherly care, but it would probably have standards met. Children will have proper time, meals, nutrition, and they won't be in a violent atmosphere. They'll get up probably early. There'll be a little bit of discipline. They'll go to schools, they'll be cared for. The uniforms are pressed and given. Or maybe they'll be taught how to look after themselves, right from putting their shoelaces on. They'll be cared for, they'll be nurtured, there'll be responsibility, there'll be obligation. So that's, that's, there are a few things that you are adding, which probably, if they were added, added into the earlier home itself, could have made a difference. So there's a possibility out there. But somehow we did not use the possibility out there with the natural home because we pulled them out of the natural home due to a crisis. And our program somehow, when we see a child in crisis and we move him out of crisis, we don't put him back into crisis. We don't wish to. And I think it does require different set of skills to work with crisis at the same time have children in those areas. It's not easy and it's not part of the lectures that I'm giving here, but I have worked in those situations as a strength-based practitioner. Um, I do have some reservations over how we do crisis management and how we could possibly also case by case deal with at-risk situations, learn from them and deal with them. Anyway, that's a different story altogether. So the objectives, what do we need the objectives for? To set up time frames. What do we need the objectives for? To set up achievements, to the goals, timelines, outcomes, all those things do become very, very important for us. Let's look at some more examples. Amnesty International, we all know that. A world in which every person enjoys all the human rights enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other international human rights instruments. It's a lofty goal. It's a really lofty goal. I remember 30 years ago when I was in India, and then prior to that, I mean, obviously in India, I used to write so many letters as a group in Amnesty, liberating, uh, you know, this leader in Tanzania, liberating writing for uh, the Nobel laureate uh, in Myanmar, you know, and, uh, you know, so many people 
who were in jails, languishing in jails. The idea was a million letters like that when they storm at the post office, some change will occur. Certainly, sometimes we used to get some good news. Somebody's stuff has been, you know, sentence has been degraded. Somebody has been allowed to go to the hospital. You know, these kind of things. But then, when I came to Australia, I was a bit shocked. We do have similar situations too. We do also do letter writing. But one finger into front, three behind. So our backyards are still full of those atrocities, those issues where the enshrined universal declaration of human rights is violated every day in various bits and pieces. Offshore refugees, onshore refugees, few people who come on many back business and we don't give a damn. So these are some of the things that come to you the moment you look at the mission statement. Charity and water. That's a very good one. Believes that we can end the water crisis in our lifetime by ensuring that every person on the planet has access to access to life's most basic need, clean drinking water. This water thing always amazes me. Water is nature's gift. In fact, it was, it was free. But then, of course, we started saying, no, we need that at a reservoir side and we need to purify it. We need to do that. And there are some costs involved and everything else. And they said, fine. So we start paying for the water, which is, in, which is in abundance available in nature. Then comes the ridiculous way of by which we bottle the water. Even in countries where we don't need to bottle the water, our water is quite good, but we bottle water and we sell that water. And uh, there is that fancy notion that uh, a bottled water is quite good. And scientifically, we also know that the bottle, the brittle bottles, plastic bottles inside, they keep on slowly melting out or losing their um, you know, whatever it is, and just gets into the into the water itself, and you might be drinking it. Never mind. That's the whole idea of the water, clean drinking water to be provided. Every now and then, if you ever watch, if you're an ardent lover of TV, television, I don't know what channels they come, but after about 10, 10, 30, you start looking at World Vision videos that come up with uh, um, rather sad, stories from Africa, Bangladesh, India, any third world country where they say two dollars of yours will give them a potable water. So you get involved with some of that kind of work. And that's what the charity water business is all about. Special Olympics, it's about people with disabilities getting an opportunity to also partake. But then look at this long 28 worded um, mission statement. It could have been more, more vibrant to transform communities by inspiring people throughout the world to open their minds, accept and include people with intellectual disabilities and thereby anyone who's perceived as different. Ah, that's too much. I remember when I was teaching disability and working in the field of disability, I had a postcard. The question on the postcard was, what should you call people with disabilities? The answer a person says was, people, beautiful. Why not? 
I guess at least we are a little more sensible in Australia. When we talk about, when we see disabil disability, we see that as a condition. We started refining our definitions. Maybe a long time back, they used to call them retards, disabled, you know, you know whatever it is, but we have changed. I think at least a human language started coming in. Person with a disability, person with mental health issues, you know, things like that make a big difference. It's a condition. It's not the same. You can't label the person. Describe the condition. That's a beautiful way. Anyway, I'm not very impressed with Special Olympics mission statements. If you want to try it, love you to do it at some point of time. Try it out. Creative Commons, of course, that needs that. Creative Commons is the kind of license that you give for whatever you do to let people take knowledge from that. In fact, most of the time when I give these lectures, interpretation could be mine. But come on, if it is Jones and May's ideas, and if it is your ideas or somebody else's ideas in the last 20, 25 years that I've gained, and I'm you know, um, rattling those some of those ideas with a little bit of experiential thought over it, do I own them? Ridiculous. Most of the time, I put my stuff and let people use it. And the reason I do that is because I haven't invented this. It's all available there. Even those others sometimes that I quote here, they too haven't invented it. It is already there. They just picked it up. Or they experienced it. So they wrote a few things. So therefore, my outlook to life is different. Knowledge is there. If I code it, my knowledge, my book, damn it, it will never empower anybody. Knowledge is there. Knowledge is power. Power when it is given to somebody. If I code it, where is power? It's like a reservoir full of rain, rain water. It will burst one day. It will flood. That's not going to be a happy situation. Better to open the floodgates and let knowledge grow. So Creative Commons is one of those wonderful things. And I've been participating in Creative Commons activities for a long, long time. It's about a new era of development, growth and production of knowledge. The veterans welfare. They're respected, their services always received, they earn entitlements recognized in our societies. We've got that. We do take care of our own veterans, RSL. Because there are a few problems left and right. They come around. The young ones who are also becoming veterans, the Afghan veterans who just came back, most of them. I think we still have a few boys and girls still there. And uh, yeah, we have respect for what they have done. They've gone from our country elsewhere, fought for the country, fought for the name. Even if they've done some, you know, some Richard activities there, it's their commanders who made them do it. I know there's a big, uh, you know, not a research, some investigation going on, some Royal Commission is going on. I know a few fellows will come through that and few fellows will confess that they have been brutal. It's the orientation altogether. So ensuring that the veterans are looked after in our country when they return is as important as any other activity. There are some learning organizations and there are also organizations which do talk about, uh, um, you know, offering 
good amount of uh, opportunity for people to um, you know, grow within an organization. Now here, what we are looking at, is it possible that we could watch the following video and write down what we think might be included in the mission goals and objectives of the headspace as an organization? How do the goals align with social work aims and values? I'm hoping for the first time I can introduce this by just pressing the video. It might open up, but otherwise, if it aborts, I request you to look at it in the PowerPoints and spend three or four minutes on this particular uh, video. And uh, I'm opening the link. Headspace is Australia's National Youth Mental Health Foundation for people aged from 12 to 25. Since 2006, hundreds of thousands of young people have accessed help at Headspace services all across Australia, in city, country and regional areas. If you're worried about something, needing information or you just want to talk to someone, there's no issue too small for Headspace to deal with. Your local centre is there for you in four important ways looking after your mental health and well-being, when you're feeling down, having trouble with school, relationships, or your family, or with something like bullying. Also, Headspace can help if you're dealing with a more serious mental health issue. Headspace takes care of your physical health too. Many Headspace centres have a doctor on site that you can go and talk to. They can also answer any sexual health questions you might have. If you're having hassles with drugs or alcohol, the health workers at a Headspace Centre can help you get back in control. And if you need a hand getting into work, study, training or an apprenticeship, your Headspace Centre can point you in the right direction. Headspace Centres come in all shapes and sizes. They're located in places you can easily access and many of them are really close to other services young people use as well. In many Headspace Centres, there's free internet and places to relax. At some centres you can just drop in, but most of the time it's best to make an appointment. Just call or email the centre. If you don't feel comfortable about making the call yourself, ask a friend or a family member. Or you can get in contact with Headspace through your doctor. Just ask for a referral and they'll make an appointment for you. Some Headspace centres are pretty busy, but most centres can see you within two weeks. Depending on which one you go to, the service will either be free or it'll only cost a small amount. Check with the Headspace Centre you're booking with to find out. When you arrive, you give your details at reception and then fill out a questionnaire. From there, you talk to an intake worker who helps match you up with the right Headspace staff member. For example, a social worker, psychologist or a doctor. All of the Headspace staff are trained to work with young people. They listen to what you have to say and they help come up with a plan to manage whatever issue you're dealing with. At Headspace, the stuff you talk about and all your personal information is kept confidential, so you don't have to worry. There are some things they need to ask a parent or carer's permission for, but they will always let you know. And if things aren't working out with the staff member they've chosen for you, that's not a problem. Headspace will find someone you feel more comfortable with. So if you're going through a tough time, Headspace can help. Go to headspace.org.au to get the contact details for your local Headspace centre. And if there isn't a centre near you, visit eheadspace.org.au to talk to someone online. If it's urgent, you can speak to someone right away. Call Kids Helpline on 1800 55 1800 or Lifeline on 131114. Right. So the goals of a non-profit take the mission statement further to describe what the organization hopes to accomplish. And that's what you could see in that uh, very, very powerful 
um, you know, advertising video of, uh, for the young people. Very vibrant, very well done. But my exercise for you was, hey, gay, can you pick up something from it at some point of time and write 20 words, 10 words for the emission statement? Okay, let's look at another example. One goal of the humane society, let's say if there is a society called humane society is to create a humane and sustainable world for animals, a world that will also benefit people. Beautiful. This school elaborates on the mission of celebrating animals while fighting against cruelty. Now that's the way some people balance out what they wish to do as far as the mission systems and mission goals are concerned. Establishing organizational objectives. Objectives are derived from uh, I think objectives are derived from goals. They do give more specific ideas how the nonprofit will achieve the goals. An organization, as we know, must have objectives and they must be clearly spelt out in the very early stages itself. They need to be measurable so that later on we when we collect data, data matrix, surveys, we know what we have done. They determine the growth, they determine how many people we serviced in a society. And of course, for all of that, the objectives need to be certainly concretized. Complexity of HSOs in goals. The challenge for organizations is having legitimacy in aligning with a larger social purpose while being accountable to specific goals and concerned with its survival and growth. That's very important. If you're at a very small area and you have the larger goals which are constantly honing on you, that's what you need to be doing. And the smaller area or the region expects you to do something different. You have an alignment issue there. The larger social purpose, Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. The local purpose, ensuring that too many of them in the RSPCA, we don't have enough funds to hold them together. We need to make sure that there are homes that we can find that are not violent to them and could be cared for. And we don't have enough resources to come in. There's only a few resources that we are expected to make from the local area. The expectation is that in some of these organizations, we raise local resources. And if the local area does not have those resources, we can't raise them. So then what do we do? Do we service or not to service? Do we take all the dogs that come in? Or how do we help people out? What happens? So goals can be vague and highly general. This may be a result of the political and economic context of attending to many interests in the environment. When we use the word political and economic at a higher level from Canberra, from Queensland government, the money, the way it's um, you know, given to various agencies. A shared consensus or understanding of goals may therefore be lacking as broad goals are open to a level of interpretation, which probably at the grassroots we don't understand. Oh, this is a big society. We've got too many things to do. Then the social worker at the lowest end and say, I don't understand. I thought what I'm asking for is also part of the larger society goal. But you're saying there's no money for what I want to do. But there's money for a large, you know, all those larger lofty goals that you've got. 
So those are the kind of parameters that you might find sometimes in relation to alignment that we probably will find it difficult to understand. I did say that before organizational goals are not static, they change over time. They can be planned for and formalized, maybe experience as the organizations drift, move away. Goal changes can be due to a range of reasons, including needing to respond to the environment. The simplest example is, let's assume in a particular area, there's a lot of young kids, children, school children, school going children. From primary school, they move to middle school, from middle school, they go to the high school, and after some time, a few of them might move away from the region. What happens then? If those institutions that have moved will have, if they have less children, less resources, less children, will they survive? They will have to reinvent themselves. In community organizations, we use the concept of hub sometimes. All services are provided in one particular area and it works in some areas. And the idea is that uh, people come for various needs and that need once taken care of need not necessarily produce another need so they go away and they may not come back to us again for, a, for some time. So we need to take into consideration the above points and envisage that there can always be a gap between the purpose or a mission of the organization and its practice the way it is experienced. Now, Jones and May have done a framework for organizational goal analysis. I think it'll be useful to you when you look at your other assignments. But of course, I'm going to give separately a couple of classes on those assignments so that you get uh, um, you know, a good grinding and understanding. Mission, goals, objectives. A mission is the broadest aim that the organization has in society. Goal is a broader statement of intent. Objective is a statement of specific intent. So you see how it narrows down. That describes desired outcomes. So when we look at a mission statement, the questions are, does the organization have a stated mission? Does the stated mission accurately portray the social role and distinctive character of the organization? So commercial organizations which may have social service wings, they try to advertise by saying, we are one of the finest in corporate social responsibility. Why? Are they hiding something else? That could be one of the ways by which we can start analysis. Not necessarily so. Their professed objective could be mining. Their professed objective could be selling cigarettes. And of course, the packet will have, you know, some, um, yeah, you know, some ugly um, aspects of surgery or wounded uh, lungs or something or the other to dissuade consumers from consuming those for a longer period of time or to always remind them, hey, this is where you're going. Never mind, they also do a different social services at a different level. They must be contributing money for research. And you and I might, may have difficulties in taking money, let's say for cancer research from I'm, I'm, I'm ideally thinking, I'm not a smoker. And if there are a few of us who are putting up a research project, would we 
think seriously about taking some money from a, an organization which manufactures cigarettes. So it's in a value judgment as far as social work is concerned. We do those kind of judgments and then we might just say, no, I'm not doing it. So how do the goals relate to the mission and the main area of organizational activity? Are the objectives clearly stated? How tight is the relationship between mission, goals and objectives? That's what we tend to see in them. Now, there are different theories and goal analysis, which some of them we have dealt with and some of them we will deal with and some of them you have, you have understanding from your other units. There is indigenous, indigenous perspectives and feminist theory perspectives you might have read or you will be reading about them. The new neo-Marxian political, economic, social structures, you'll gain a little bit from sociology. You will have some understanding that you'll bring from there. Systems theory, you might have read it or you might get an opportunity to do so. And um, if at some point of time, if you are interested and you want something on systems theory, um, yeah, I might even uh, point to you an audio from one of my YouTube uh, programs. I'm quite sure there's one, but that's not something that I generally teach in this subject. Human relations, organizational needs to be able to respond to individual needs. That's the crux of it. Scientific management is basically that machine-like clear goals to achieve outcomes. So those are the kind of things which we have kind of touched base with before and we will continue to talk through as, as in future lectures. Goals are designed to meet, respond to key groups in environment, in funding and legislative bodies. So they are very important for us because they have to be influencing to get us some money. Senior management boards and stakeholders in the environment do have considerable control over organization goals. That is true because they make sure everything is ticked off and they don't want to have very lofty goals. You know, if you say funding will be based on uh, you know, various, uh, you know, various issues that crop up at the grassroots and as social workers bring about and advocate on behalf of clients, we will be pumping in funds. No organization will accept that. They'll say, tell us something. We got to start somewhere with some kind of a generic metric, which is about what could be the percentage of people, how many emergency situations we can anticipate, how many, what could be the caseload that we can have, how many people are there. So they're all based on some data, some estimations, some, some kind of a chance, but also there will be a little bit of money for contingencies. The ability to analyze power and authority is central to understanding how goals emerge. Identifying groups who have influence and those who, that don't. And for those who don't have a power influence, we use the word advocacy. Social workers go and do that interpretation for them. Consumer groups sometimes are very poorly placed to influence goals because they, are, they already have too many problems. They want somebody to solve them. They don't want to contribute to goal management and things like that. And uh, it's our duty as a profession to ensure that some of that actually takes place. So consumer groups are poorly placed to influence goals that we've said. Organizational strategy is a plan for how an organization will achieve its goals. It influences organizational design to help the organization accomplish its strategic intent and keep a focus on the organization's mission, vision, and goals. So what are we saying? 
what we are saying here is a strategy ought to respond both to the internal as well as external. External stakeholders are those who give you money, who audit you, who look after various other resources that you might require. The environment, the culture. Is the strategy focused on maintaining maintenance, maintenance, growing, differentiating the organization, as you can see in one of the examples in future, and uh, the organization that you'll be doing for your assignments will show you all those ramifications. Effectiveness and efficiency. These are two words with which we, we, we use these words quite a lot in management of human services. It's important to understand the link between goals and organizational survival. Organizations are always evaluated and how they achieve their goals, how they write their programs for those goals, how those programs are delivered. What's the access rate? Are they equitable? Were they delivered in time? Did they meet the client's needs? So that evaluation, program evaluation, as we call it. So efficiency then relates to the amount of resources that have been put in, minimum resources, maximum results. That's very clear because there is a resource crunch. People expect that you put little bit and get something more out of it. So the questions are, how might an organization, an organization be highly efficient, but not effective? I want to leave that thought with you. Make it efficient. Means everything is, guys, if you don't have an appointment, you can't come in here. Then what happens? Maybe very few clients will come. Then what happens? It may not show its effectivity. How might an organization be highly effective but not efficient? It's, it allows people to come any time. Does seem to value the client focus a shade more than the others. What happens then? Maybe the client flow increases. The client flow increases to such an extent that you're no longer able to efficiently deal with everybody. You know, don't have time to write notes. You put post-it slips here and there. I need to write a note about Richard. I need to write a note about this client, that client. God, two weeks later, you, your car got busted. For two or three days, you haven't come. You got other things to do. You come back, you got a blank head. Or you got enough work to do. All those notes need to be transformed, transcribed, put into the system. But then there's a new client list that's grown up. So efficiency versus effectivity. So what we generally tend to tell social work students is, guys, right in the beginning, you got to do these two and you need to ensure as far as possible, put them in, 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 in a perspective. If we don't have that perspective, our personal care perspective gets buggered your personal care goes down. You get stressed, you get burnt out. You need services. That's a bad game. You, you need services, that's a good question. That's a good thing to say. Social workers also need services. But remember one thing, we are the torch bearers. We got to look after ourselves, look after somebody else. That's what the profession is all about. 
truly the professional will come to take care of you too. But there's an onus on us to take care of ourselves, self-care. I'll address that at some point of time. I think we do spend supervision, self-care, burnout. There's a big lecture on that. And uh, we will come to that. So the next slide is about some of the final threads. What are the key discussion points that we have come to in this lecture? Taking into consideration the complexities of organization goals, consider the risks to your professional role and satisfaction in that role without an understanding of this. That's a very tricky thing. What are the possible connections between a lack of understanding of goals and the experience of stress by workers? Raise that question. If you are in social service agency, and if you are not also, raise that in the context of some of the other assignments that you'll be doing. How might social workers strategically refer to and utilize organizational goals to achieve the aims and values of the profession? How creatively you can work with those goals? How subversively you can work with those goals? You know, you don't have to be working in a, you know, you don't have to develop a dubious distinction of somehow managing it. You need to be transparent. You need to uphold values. You need to show that distinctive leadership that is expected out of social work in the organization. Whether you are a grassroots, mid-management, whatever it is, hey, you are important. Some might think they are cogs in the wheel, but without those cogs, the wheel doesn't cycle. The wheel doesn't move. So it's important for us to understand and give that importance to who we are, what we do, and when we can do. How can we recognize low goal consensus in an organization and team and between different departments of an organization. Some people just amble around. I don't know. I'm just coming around, making sure I can do something and move on. There are, then there are others who might say, look, all of us must have a transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach when we're looking at, let's say, in the context of disability, allied health people, nurses, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, psychologists, social workers, recreational therapists. All of us, we have a role to play where in ensuring that the client gets a service that is comprehensive. How might goal displacement or a goal drift raise ethical dilemmas for social workers? They do. Take that question, reflect in your ethics areas. You might touch upon it as we move on, but certainly not in this particular subject. Okay, so um, I know these books have always become an issue, but ne nevertheless, if you do get an opportunity, Jones and May, I understand, is also sold in the market as pre-loved book because it's an old book. If you still get it, that's good. Uzain and uh, Uzain and Rose, um, yeah, it's, it's available in the market. Some people use that in some of the universities, but this is from those kind of books that we have utilized. Thank you, and um, hopefully this will answer some of your questions. And uh, if there are questions, please post them. Send me an email. And one thing you might have noticed on your um, you know, topics and other things that I'm uh, very, very responsive. Immediately I try to answer. And my answers are placed, uh, whether it's just a small problem solving or whatever it is, I place it straight there. And if there is something that I need to bring it and flag it to my head of the school, I do that. And um, do give me feedback. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.